one. Hey, welcome to Louise's Bible study again. Uh, I've been studying in the book of Romans with uh, my wonderful teacher, Bob Indian. I think I've told a lot of you about him, so you need to look him up on your website or anything and get a lot of his teaching because he's really, really good. But we've been teaching, uh, he's been teaching in the book of Romans. I remember a long time ago, prior to ever going on to Rainbow Bible Training Center, that I asked my mother something about if she ever read the book of Romans, and she said, oh, no, no, it's the hardest book in the Bible to understand. And so I kind of shied away from it for a long time because I thought, well, goodness, if it was so hard for my mom, you know, maybe it, I just don't know if I want to get into that. The book of Romans is really not difficult. We just need to break it down a little bit in pieces so that we can understand it and digest it. But the main question I want to ask you is, if you're a believer, whether you're a new believer or whether you've been a Christian for a long time, have you ever found yourself in constantly, it seems like, and you're just there's almost like a battle that's going on between you and your spirit man and what's going on in it. And so often there's such conflict and sometimes you just want to throw your hands up and say, I can't do this. I can't do this. I cannot live the Christian life that God has expected me to live. It's just impossible. Well, I want to first off tell you one thing. God will never ask you to do anything that he hasn't given you everything you need to do it, okay? So you have two of the most important factors. You have the Word and you have the Holy Spirit. So he has not left you out here dangling. But the question is, if, if, you're, if you're struggling to live this Christian walk, then we need to find out where the conflict is. What is the struggle? Because I did that for so long. I would try and try and, eh, you know, i get along pretty good for a while and then bam, I would slip. Either something would come out of my mouth that was unloving, I would be critical, found myself gossiping at times. I found myself walking not in the fruit of the Spirit, but uh, of things that I had done prior to being born again. And I found it very frustrating. And I thought, well, if somebody's looking at me for an example of what it's like to be a Christian, I really miss the mark. And, and so one day as I was reading the Bible, it said, Paul said, I'm more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. And you know what God wants from us? He wants an honest conversation. He does not want you to sit there and be so religious and cover everything up and pretend like everything's hunky-dory. He wants you to have a very honest conversation. And I said to him, well, you know what? This is not working. I don't, I'm not an overcomer. I live more under circumstances than I do over them, and I find myself falling all the time, doing things that I really don't want to do, feeling condemned, uh, constantly not knowing which way to go. And then what I would, I vacillate back and forth, back and forth, and, and I would either be t so condemned by what I had done and, and the things that I was had gotten myself into, and I say I got myself into them because I did. The devil didn't do it. I did it. Um, and then I would turn around and I'd want to do all kind of good works. I thought, well, if I would go, if I'd go enough times to Bible class, if I would go enough times to church, if I would give enough money, if I would tithe more, God would be pleased with me and happy with me. And so therefore, you know, I would make up for anything that I had done. And, and that didn't work. I couldn't keep that up. I mean, you know, that lasted for a little while. 
And then a little bit later, I found myself right back doing the things that I knew that God didn't want me to do. I remember I had somebody say to me one time who, who was who was very uh, judgmental, had no idea what I was going through. But they said, you're just walking all over the blood of Jesus. And I thought, oh, God, what am I doing? This is terrible. And, and it just broke my heart. And I thought, how do I get out of this terrible mess that I'm in? And then one day when I was listening to Bob and studying in the book of Romans, he, he began to put this situation together. And chapter 7 brings it up to um, the conflict of two natures in verse 14. And you see, what we don't realize is, and I'm going to explain it to you as easily as I can, when you're born again, you have a new creature. You're a new person. You are 100% holy, righteous, sanctified, set apart. You are God's holy temple. You will never be more righteous, more sanctified, more set apart spiritually. You are a new person in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit has come to live in your spirit. But your flesh has not been redeemed. And your flesh, this outward man that has dominated your life for so long, has not been set free. It is still under bondage to sin. And you have what you call a sin nature. Paul refers to it in two times. It's either the sin nature or the flesh. So you can, you can vacillate back and forth between sin nature and flesh. You have been redeemed in your spirit. You're justified in your spirit. But your problem is the sin nature that still abides in your flesh. And what happens is there, there, there comes a point when the sin nature wars against your spirit man and then there's this battle that goes on because the spirit man wants to please and walk holy with God, but the sin nature wants to do what it's always done. And so Paul says here, oh, I am the most miserable of creatures. And he, he I, I, I mean, really, your heart just bleeds for him. So he said in verse 24, um, wretched and miserable man that I am, who will rescue me and set me free from this body of death, this corrupt mortal existence. I mean, he's finally come to the realization of who his enemy is. You know, so often we're shadow boxing. We don't really understand who our enemy is. We often blame everything on the devil. The devil made me fall down and break my wrist. No, I fell over some books because I wasn't looking and I broke my wrist. The devil did not make me fall down. And here comes my cat. Sorry, guys. Fall down to break my wrist. Um, and then, you know, people say, well, the devil made me go here or the devil made me do this. The devil cannot make you do anything that you don't want to do. God cannot make you do anything that you don't want to do. You have to cooperate with, the, with Satan. And Satan's avenue of getting to you is through the flesh. He always operates from the flesh to the mind. He can't get to your spirit, man, because God lives in your spirit once you're born again. But God works from your spirit to the outside, through your mind to your flesh. So you can see how the two operate. Well, then we come to this point here in the middle, and this point here in the middle is called the mind. Now, in some translations, it's called the soul, and in some Greek translations, it's referred to as the heart. But if you look that word up, just be sure you look it up because it could be the mind and it could be the spirit. But it is the inner man. 
And the inner man has to deal with this flesh. And the way that you conquer it is by the renewing of your mind to the Word of God. When you get your mind lined up with your spirit, then you take dominance over your flesh. You dominate your flesh. You tell your flesh, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not saying that. Now, you know what? The Holy Spirit's a gentleman, and he doesn't yell and scream at you. There will be a nudging or maybe a still small voice that says, uh, you know, you'll be in a conversation with somebody and they'll ask you something and immediately you have, you're at this crossroads where either I cut this off or I get into gossip, okay? And so there's a nudging there, there's a knowledge, a consciousness that comes forth and you go, you know, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about that situation. We're just going to move on. Or you may find sometimes that uh, you lose your temper. Ever lost your temper? And you want to go, whoa, where did that come from? Where did those angry words come from? Well, they came from your flesh. That's where it came from. But you know what? Go to 1 John 1, 9. That's one of the most, such an important scripture <coughs> for every believer. Go to 1 John 1, 9 and say, Father, I'm sorry. Forgive me for, for, for sinning against you and cleanse me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I ask forgiveness in Jesus' name. And that's, that's the end of it as far as he's concerned. Done deal. And not only does he forgive you, but I love this. He forgets it. We don't forget. So Satan is constantly trying to roll back that old film and remind you of how, well, you know what, you, you think you're so good. You remember how you acted, blah, 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 and how you did and what you did. And, you know, people are real good at bringing up your past mistakes. They love to rub your nose in it. And they'll remind you of, you know, well, you used to do that. I don't know why you you're saying that I shouldn't or you're you're feel that I, you're judging me uh, because you used to do that. Well, you know what? I used to do a lot of things when I was a child that I don't do anymore. There are things that I've done in my past that I'm not pleased about. But you know what? I move on. I don't live in the past, and and I've asked God to forgive me, and I want to continue to grow up and grow more spiritual and be a, a be a, the character of God. And and if somebody wants to throw my past up into my face, well, that's their problem, okay? God doesn't do that. I love that. My father never does that. He always encourages me. He always says, oh, Louise, you know what? I don't know what you're talking about. Move on. And so, you know what I love is, is when we can repent and go to the Lord and say, forgive me, and I want to I want to do better. Well, the Holy Spirit's right there with you. He is right there, and He's pulling for you all the way. But you have to renew your mind to the Word of God. You have to get it in your mind, what it is in God's Word that pleases the Father. And you know, everything is by grace through faith. Faith receives grace from God. And when you learn how to receive God's goodness, His mercy, His kindness, and all the benefits that He has towards you, then you want to do good. You want to operate in a manner that is pleasing to the Father. You, have you ever been um, in a sport? You know, I play, I play tennis, and I've done horseback riding and all this stuff. But have you ever been in a sport where, you know, you're in the group and you want to stand out and you want to do so hard what your coach or your trainer or the person that's there telling you to do. And it just makes your face light up when you realize, I did it. I, I actually accomplished that. He's proud of me. Oh, that's so wonderful. I'm so excited because I, I really did it. That's the way we feel when we have overcome 
an area in our lives that has been uh, tormenting us for so long. And we finally realize that we have authority in that area and we can take authority in that area. I know there are people that have uh, drug problems and there are people that have alcoholism and there are people that have sexual addictions. All of these addictions are of the flesh. Now, if you're born again, God has given you the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit to take authority over these situations in your flesh. But let me tell you something. It's not going to be easy. It's not an easy-peasy thing. When I had COVID, um, while I was in the hospital, because I, I was so sick, and they had locked me in this room, and there was nobody that came into the room except the nurses dressed and looked like something out of Star Wars. And there was no personal communication other than checking your vitals and looking at things. And I can't even begin to, to tell you what a horrible experience that was laying there 24 hours day after day after day after day after day and having nothing but blank walls to look at. And so what they did, which was unbeknownst to me, because I could care less at that point, they gave me, um, what I want to say, um, a drug that is very, very addictive to calm you down and keep you calm. It's a mood drug that keeps you calm. I can't even think of the name of it right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it's a very addictive drug. And um, they gave it not only once a day, but they gave it to me two times a day. So I was just kind of in a sort of a zombie state. And um, when I came home, um, I didn't think about it. They just gave me the prescription and told me to keep taking it. And I just kept taking it, you know. And I thought, wow, I'm just, I am the coolest person. I just, ah, I'm so happy. Well, when I realized from my daughter what it was that I had been taking and what I had been given, she went, oh, Mommy, you have got to get off that. Well, when I did some research on it, people didn't just get off of it. You usually had to have better rehab. You had to have some help. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing any of that. I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I don't have to be taking anything that is not good for me. I'm not doing this anymore. So the first night, I was fine. No problem. Oh, and I thought, well, this is a breeze. And the next night, a problem. By that time, it had worn off. And I remember going upstairs because I thought I don't want to you know, bother my husband. But I was upstairs and all night long I had to go through uh, withdrawal symptoms. And um, by the next day, I was good. And, you know, God said to me during that night, He said, we are going to get through this. Because, see, your body gets addicted to what you put in it. And when you start denying your body, your flesh is going to have a fit. And he said, we're going to get through this. So I did, and I called up my doctor, and I said, I'm not taking this anymore. And he said, well, thank you, Lord Jesus. And he said... Do you need any help? And I said, no, I, I'm done. I finished. I went through it. I, I'm, he said, Louise, that's a miracle. And I said, no, that's God. Because that's the kind of God we serve. But it wasn't easy. There wasn't easy, anything easy about it. And I'm going to tell you something. There would be times when maybe things would get rough or things would get tense and the and and your and in your flesh, I say your flesh would speak to my mind and say, Well, you know, if you just took one, if you just took one, and I thought, one, I'm not taking anything. I've got Jesus. I am not going to take anything. I'm never going back to that. I will never put that in my mouth again. I didn't want it in the first place. 
And so um, we get ourselves so often in these situations where, you know, we, we, we socially drink. You can social drink and you can have one a glass or two a glass, three a glass. And then you find yourself, we, it's, it's 12 o'clock. I'll have a, a glass of wine. What's the big deal? And then I find people don't know how to associate. They don't know how to socialize in the evenings, it seems like, without somebody coming over and having a drink. If you don't have a drink, why come? Well, you know what? That's where addiction gets started. And you begin to take more and more and more and more and more until you find yourself, you're totally out of control. And if you're not a believer, you, you're really swimming upstream because you're trying to do it in your own ability and you don't have the ability, I can tell you that. But as a believer, you do. You have God who's standing there with you and will help you to do whatever he has asked you to do to walk this walk. But what I wanted to say to some of y'all out there if you're losing your patience, if you're getting angry, if you're depressed, if you're frustrated, if you find yourself saying, I, this is not working, I'm just not able to live this Christian life, don't give up on yourself. Don't. Because this is a growth process. This takes time. Babies don't learn to run, they learn to crawl and then they learn to walk, and they fall down, and they have boo-boos, and they cry. But you know what? They get back up. And a good parent isn't always there to pick them back up. They let them have these situations so they can learn. And then they learn how to get back up, dust themselves off, and say, I'm going to keep going. That's what we have to do as Christians. We are living in the last the last days. And, and you have to look around, and some people are growing faint of heart. They're saying, I can't do this anymore. Where's God? I'm losing it. I'm not walking the walk. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the pressures of life. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because you have the greater one that lives inside you. And he is for you and not against you. And he will never tell you you can do something that he doesn't back you up 100%. But one thing about God, you have to put the first foot forward and then he will come along beside. He's not going to drag you through. You have to be the one to step into it. And so I want to tell some of you to buckle up and hang in there. It's going to get better. I love this. One day something came up and I was thinking about something, you know, and worry is always in the future. Always in the future. And um, I, was, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I, I fell down. My husband and I are getting so old. <laughs> We're really not. Well, I guess in years, but I don't think either one of us feel it that much. But I thought... Oh my gosh, I just fell over a box of books. What happens, you know, about the next time I fall and, and, and nobody finds me for a week and I begin to have this pity party. It's like, oh God, what am I going to do? You know, I don't want to go to the hall. And he said, Louise, have I not always planned for every problem? Do you not think that I know that this is going to be a problem? And have I not made a plan? And have I not found you an answer? And I just want to share one last thing to all of you out there to show you how far in the future God plans for us. My husband and I got married and I was 45 years old when I had my son. And I want to tell you, at 45, I'm like, what am I doing? I was so old that I was the oldest woman in the nursery with the children. And I had to get help getting up from the floor when I was down with my son playing. And, and you know, we're both well above the age. And, um, and so... We went through this time period. My son is 33 years old now. 
and he is a pilot and he has his own company and he is so take charge and you know he just came right into us and he said look I'm taking over the finances you don't have to worry about that anymore I'm going to do all the bills you don't have to worry about that anymore I'm taking over everything and I'm doing this I'm doing that and I'm uh, and if anything ever happens whatever don't worry about it guys you can come and live with me you can move in I'll take over I'm, I'm there for you and I was thinking when he came to visit last time he was running around helping his dad do this and helping me do this and he was there and I thought I looked at him and I said you know we didn't plan for you but God did because he knew that in our elder years we were going to need you and you are our retirement plan and you are such a blessing and we love you so much because you are the most patient kind gentle he never gets upset he never he never fusses Cheap. he he's he's a good manager of everything and it's just amazing to me how God knew way ahead of time, 33 years ahead of time, that these days we were going to need our son, that we had taken care of, her, care of him, and now he's come in and he's taking care of us. My point to y'all is this. There is no situation that God has not made a plan for. There is nothing that's come along in your life that God cannot get you out of. He wants the best for you. So don't worry about tomorrow. Take your hands off of these situations. Give them to Him. And know that when you worry or these things come about, you have to renew your mind to the Word of God. And you have to say, God says, cast all my care upon you, Lord, because you careth for me. I'm not going to worry about this. You see, and then your mind is renewed and your spirit man and your mind get together and they take over and calm the flesh down and tell the flesh, go have a seat in the back. You're not driving this car anymore, okay? You're not in charge. And so I think it's interesting how we need to know who our enemy is. Your enemy is not, Satan's your enemy. I'm not saying he's not. But I am saying the avenue that he uses the most is the flesh. And most of the times, your flesh and your past lifestyle prior to being born again is your biggest problem. And so you need to learn how to overcome it, how to dominate it in the spirit, so that you can walk in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and not fulfill the sins of the flesh. I want to leave you with that note today. I love every one of you. Thanks for tuning in. And by the way, keep keep the notes coming. I'm trying to answer them for you as much as I can. And I really like hearing from you. Thank you. Bye-bye.